Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at prophecy and the epistles to the Thessalonians in our continuing survey of the New Testament. The first question I want to ask is about this word eschatology. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos. It means last, and, and eschatology is, is the study of the last things in the Bible. Now, one of the questions we asked then, what is the eschatology of the Old Testament? What did that look like? You see, the writers of the New Testament already assumed a pre-existing eschatology. They already presupposed that you knew something about the last things. And they used those terms and those ideas from the Old Testament. For example, in the Old Testament, you had an old covenant that had been established with Moses, and yet there was a promise, even back in Moses' day, that there would one day come a prophet that would be like Moses, who had spoken to God face to face, and people would listen to him. Back in the Old Testament, they were under a an old covenant, a covenant that God had made with his people Israel, and yet there was a promise that there was coming eventually a new covenant that would be internalized, that would be in people's hearts. Now, in the Old Covenant, you always have the picture of God coming into his temple. Remember when uh, Moses first built the tabernacle? Um, the presence of the Lord comes into the tabernacle. Later on, when Solomon builds the temple and they offer, offer a prayer of dedication, then the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, moves into the temple. Um, but then, after the people had sinned, the, the, the temple was destroyed, the people were carried away in Babylon, they came back into the land, and they rebuilt the temple, and the presence of God did not come in. And so the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, ends with a promise that one day, God's going to come into his temple, and the promise is par part and parcel with the New Covenant, where God would come to his people. And so in the Old Covenant, God comes into his temple, it ends, though, with a promise that one day God is suddenly going to come to his temple. That's pr that promise is given in Malachi, chapter, chapters 3 and 4. Now, what additions did Jesus make to that eschatology? Jesus comes on the scene, and uh, he's giving new promises. And one of the things that he does, he comes into the temple... And he says, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. Now, he wasn't, even though he was standing in this specific temple when he said those words, he wasn't talking about the physical structure of the temple. He was talking about his own body. John chapter 2 makes that very clear. Uh, it actually gives us that little added commentary. I'm so glad that's added, because we'd be arguing, was that the physical temple? Was that the spiritual temple? No, it was the temple of his body. Um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 2, though, says, uh, now this is an, at another point, he says, Truly I say to you, not one stone here, and he's speaking of the physical temple, will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So when, sometimes when Jesus is speaking of the temple, sometimes he's speaking of the physical, earthly temple, the place over there in Jerusalem, and other times he's speaking of the temple of his body. Wisdom is knowing which is the difference. He goes on to say, Matthew 24, verse 14, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So you get the idea. There's going to be some things that happen first. The gospel is going to go out to all the nations. By the way, it did in the book of Acts. You know, we, we have that, that uh, uh, it went throughout the entire known world to all the nations. And then the promise is that the end would come. And he goes on to say in chapter 24, verse 15, the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, they would see that standing in the holy place. Now, that's an interesting prophecy, because if you'd asked anybody in Jesus' day, when had that taken place, the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, they would have referenced back in the days of Maccabees, when a pagan king had come into the temple and had set up this abomination, this statue of Zeus, and told everybody to worship it, they would have said, that's when that happened, and yet Jesus says, no, it's going to happen again. So, let's look at the eschatology of Jesus. 
First of all, he says that the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. That is, the cross is coming. And the gospel is going to be preached to the nations. And then the Son of Man is going to come, and he will be seen coming in his kingdom. And at that point, and I'm describing Matthew chapter 24 right now, uh, he will come with his angels with him. They will gather his elect, and the world will be judged. That's Matthew chapter 25. And he will set up his eternal kingdom. Now, there's a sense in which Jesus had already... Uh, brought his kingdom he said you know uh, don't look for you know uh, signs over here or signs over there uh, for i tell you the kingdom is in your midst but there was still going to be an entry into a future eternal kingdom so w was the kingdom already was it not yet and my answer is that it was both now what additions did the book of acts make to that eschatology. Acts chapter 3 verses 19 through 21 says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So, so there were still, even though Jesus had come, even though he had brought in one sense the kingdom, there were still future times of refreshing that had to come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus. So Jesus had already uh, ascended into heaven, but he was going to come back and that the Lord may, that, that God may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, for whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the, pro the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. So um, notice, we're not done yet. There's more to come. There's more prophecy to be fulfilled. There's a second coming that is being promised. So, the eschatology of the book of Acts is that Jesus had died and was buried and risen and now has ascended to the Father. And that now we're in that period until the restoration, the period of restoration of all things. And then the Son of Man is going to come. Again, the same as the eschatology of, of Jesus. And the world will be judged and will have an eternal kingdom. Now, what additions does Paul make to that eschatology? And to, to answer that, we're going to look at the first epistle of the Thess to the Thessalonians. If you go to Thessalonica, or as they call it today, Thessaloniki, it's still a, a city today, on a clear day, you can look out across the harbor and you can see in the distance Mount Olympus. Um, right in the middle of the city, and, and it's the second largest city in all of Greece, uh, they have un, un, uh, uncovered this big central plaza where ancient Ephesus once stood with its odium, with its marketplaces, and, and you, can, you can still go and see these marketplaces where Paul might have shopped when he was there. And the book starts off, chapter 1, verse 1, and, you know, once Paul goes through his traditional... Uh, uh, his traditional introduction, you know, I Paul an apostle writing to you and so on. Uh, he speaks about their sh their shared salvation history, and so Paul starts off by speaking, "I'm so thankful of God's choice for you. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, uh, because God chose you, uh, and about how you responded to that choice, uh, you." showed the life of Jesus. Our gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power. And you began, you became imitators of us and of the Lord Jesus, having received the word. And so you turned to the Lord, and I'm so glad that you did. Uh, the word of God sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place uh, your faith toward God has gone forth. And so you turned to the Lord He gets to chapter 2 now, uh, actually chapters 2 and 3, Paul describes his, mes his ministry in Thessaloniki. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 he says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship and how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaimed to you 
the gospel of God. And so he takes them through um, just reminding them of how he ministered to them and now how he has sent Timothy to them uh, to get a report from them to see how the church was going. You see, Paul had planted this church, had not spent a lot of time there, uh, and then had had to move on. And now Timothy is being sent back just to see how they're doing. And so chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And we come to chapter 4, and now Paul is giving his so what. You see, he's described what has happened in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, 1, 2, and 3, I should say. Uh, that's a look to the past. And now in chapter 4, he is exhorting them to walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ. So the principle is stated in chapter 4, verse 1. Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that you, as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just you actually do walk, that you excel still more. In other words, you know, do it. Now that you know how to walk, go do it. Um, and part of that is he calls them to sexual purity. He says in verse 2, For you know what commandments we gave to you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And one way that's supposed to be worked out, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. And so he speaks to that issue in particular, in verses 3 through 8. And then he also calls them to responsible work. Uh, verse 9, he says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice that, but again, he says, excel still more, and make it your ambition, this is verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, and to attend to your own business, and work with your own hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders, and not be in any need. And now he gives a promise, in the face of, you know, there's some folks that, that might have died in the interim, you know, because in any large group, eventually people die. And he says in verse 13, I, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, and that's not talking about just those who are sleeping in church, but rather uh, that's a euphemism to speak about people that have died. And he says, we don't want you to grieve as do the rest who have no hope, because there's a promise of comfort for those who have died in the face of those who remain about the, our beloved ones who have died. And what he does is he gives a prophecy about the coming of the Lord. Now when he says this, remember that Jesus had already given some promises and some prophecies about his coming. And what Paul says is echoed in the words of Jesus back in Matthew chapter 24. For example, Matthew 24 had said, uh, they will see the Son of Man coming. Now, Paul now talks about how the Lord himself will descend from heaven. It's the same Lord. It's the same, you know, Matthew calls him Son of Man. Jesus calls him the Lord himself. But it's the same one. You know, we, we, it's Jesus. In Matthew 24, uh, Jesus had talked about how he will send forth his uh, angels with a great trumpet. Here in Matthew, in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the trumpet of God. In Matthew 24, uh, Matthew had said how they will gather together his elect, his chosen ones, from the four winds. Here in 1 Thessalonians 4, we who are alive will be caught up together. So again, it's gathering God's people. In Matthew 24, that coming was described on the clouds of the sky. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 17, we shall be caught up together with them in clouds. So Paul is going out of his way to describe the coming of the Lord in the same terms, using the very same words, same phrases, that Matthew 24 described the second coming. So this is the same thing. Well, this is Paul describing the same thing. But he's going to add something. You see what he adds in verse 15 is that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That is, the Lord's going to come from heaven 
um, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. That's something that Matthew 24 didn't mention. And so Paul adds to that eschatology, builds upon it. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. So you know how it all fits in. Let's add that one notation that the dead in Christ will live, rise first. And now we come to chapter 5, where we are called to live in light of Christ's return. So b chapters 1 through 3 were what God has done in our lives. Chapters 4 and 5 now, how we are to live as a result of what God has done in our lives. And we see this in chapter 5. Um, we're, we're called to not be in darkness, that that day would overtake you as a thief. That's chapter 5, verse 4. For you are sons of light and sons of the day, not of night or of darkness. So then, don't sleep. Um, but, verse 8, since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and of love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So, we're to live in light of the day of the Lord. Live in light of that. Uh, verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you were doing. And then he again gives some attitudes towards Christian workers, verses 12 and 13. We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work and then live in peace uh, with one another. And finally, he gives them enclosing instructions. He, he urges them to admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Don't repay each other for evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And then he gives these, these little loves. I, I almost think of them as bullet points. Uh, verse 16, rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you. Verse 19, don't quench the spirit. Um, and then we get down to verse 23, and he gives a benediction. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now we come to the second epistle of the Thessalonians. And I'm entitling this epistle, Facing the Flame. And you'll see why in just a moment. We begin 2 Thessalonians. It's only going to be three chapters long. Chapter 1 is a promise of relief to those who are under persecution. And Paul begins speaking about uh, how we ought to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it's only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each other of you toward one another grows even greater uh, in uh, and therefore, uh, we speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance. So, uh, they're persevering, and uh, the, the continuing of their faith and love of the Thessalonian church is a cause of thanksgiving. And then he speaks of the affliction through which they are going, um, and how this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you'll be considered worthy of the kingdom, uh, because it's only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are being afflicted, and to us as well. And this is going to take place when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who don't know God. Uh, and so there's a promise of God's return, his avenging return, upon those who, in verse 9, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day. Now that's the same thing that God had promised, uh, that Paul had promised to the Thessalonians in his first epistle, that, that Christ is going to come and that everything's going to be set right. And the same promise is right here. And so he prays for the Thessalonians, verse 11, to this end we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling. And that's his continuing prayer for them. Now we come to chapter 2. Chapter 2 gives us a warning of troubles that must precede the day of the Lord. And so we start in verses 1 and 2. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Same coming he's talked about in the previous chapter. And our gathering together to him. And 
things that he's talked about back in First Thessalonians, that you do not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us. Apparently there's a danger that somebody might have been forging an epistle uh, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Because it hasn't come because something has to happen first. And what is first, he says in chapter 2, verse 3, let no one deceive you, uh, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. This man of lawlessness first has to be revealed. So let's look look at it. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now that sounds very much like something that had happened 200 years earlier in the days of the Maccabees when a lawless person had gotten up in the temple, a, a pagan Greek king had come into the temple in Jerusalem and had stood up and said, here you're going to worship Zeus instead, had put a statue of Zeus and had taken a seat in the temple of God. And Paul is describing not that not as something that's going to happen in the past, but something that it's going to happen in the future. And so notice in Paul's day, Jesus had already come. And the day of the Lord is coming. Yes, that's, that's on its way. But before that takes place, first, you must have what's called the apostasy, the falling away. And also, now that's always a negative term. So don't think falling away like, you know, being caught up to heaven. It's not that kind of falling away. Uh, it's a negative term, the apostasy. And then the man of sin must be revealed. And that's going to happen before the day of the Lord. And, verse 6, and you know what restrains him. It hasn't happened yet, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Whatever is going to happen, it's already taking place. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So, there's something restraining this. It's already sort of here, but it's not here yet, because... There's one that's restraining, and then he's going to be taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay by the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Now, we've already talked about his coming back in First Thessalonians, how he's going to come and gather his people, and here he's going to bring... To an end, that lawless, one, by, by, that lawless one, by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. And so there's a warning there that Christ is going to come, and he's going to put an end to the coming of that other one. That one who is in accord with the activity of Satan. Now, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe that which is false in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Those are, are dangerous and sober words. Now, what is this, and what is this man of sin? Who is this, the identity of this man of sin? Some suggestions have been supposed. First of all, it has been noted that there was the Roman Emperor Caligula who had actually issued orders, very similar to that pagan Greek uh, king who had lived 200 years before Jesus, back in the days of the Maccabees, and the, the Roman Emperor Caligula had said, I want a statue of myself put up that it can be worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem. And he actually gave orders of that take place. Now, the orders were not carried out. The, uh, the um, governor of Syria said, are you sure you're going to 
start all sorts of, you know, um, they're, they're going to revolt and you're going to just make a real mess over here. Are you really sure you want to do that? Uh, and he questioned the orders, and of course the, the questioning took time. Uh, you know, the order had to travel, you know, you couldn't just pick up the telephone, so the order had to travel all the way to the, to the Middle East, and then the, are you sure you want to do that, had to go all the way back to Rome. And Caligula ordered, yes, I'm sure, well actually he rescinded it, but he, he ordered uh, that that Roman governor who had said, are you sure, for questioning my orders, you're supposed to be put to death, and, and the good news is that Caligula himself was was assassinated. Uh, and so none of the orders were carried out. That's a good thing. So that's sort of the background of what was taking place at the very time that Paul was writing these words. He had ordered a statue of himself placed in the temple in Jerusalem, um, but it wasn't carried out. Now, a few years later, in fact, this is going to take place after the death of Paul, you're going to have the Roman general Titus along with his father initially, his father is going to, uh, while this is taking place, uh, his father is going to be made the emperor of Rome, and Titus will stay behind to finish conquering, uh, putting down the, the Jewish revolt, and he will conquer Jerusalem, and he will destroy the temple in Jerusalem, and will set up, you know, when they're, when they're done destroying the temple, they're going to build a pagan altar, and they're going to offer sacrifices to their pagan gods. A bit like what had happened 200 years earlier, a bit like what is described in Paul's in Paul's epistle here. Also, about 50, 60 years later, after this, in the second century, the Roman emperor Trajan is going to say, you know, that's a great spot for a temple. I'm going to build a temple to Jupiter there on what had b previously been the site of Solomon's temple and he's going to order that to be built and there will be a great revolt. The Bar Kokhba revolt will take place as he begins, you know, plans, announces plans to build a pagan temple on the site of the old Jewish temple and there will be a, that, that revolt will be put down there will be a great many Jews slaughtered. In fact, after this time, Jews will not be permitted in the city of Jerusalem for 500 years. Now, some have looked at this man of sin as being fulfilled in the Roman Catholic Church, um, which uh, I suppose, especially from those of us of the Protestant and Reform persuasion, we look at their theology the way it went over the long haul. This didn't happen immediately, but over the long haul, they rejected uh, justification uh, by grace through faith alone and endorsed what Paul, I think, would describe as another gospel. And the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church wandered far afield from those of the New Testament by adding to the scriptures. A and it's noted that the Pope is said to be the vicar of Christ. That is, you know, he, he's you know, ruling instead of Christ. He's the, can I say this word, the anti-Christ. The, the reformers um, looked at this passage, Martin Luther and, and John Calvin, they said, well, that's the Pope. That's, that's describing the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. Or there are those uh, who look at this passage and say, well, it is all yet to be fulfilled. It's, it has a future fulfillment. And, you know, when you're talking about future fulfillment, uh, you can't link it to something that's already taken place. So you're, you're saying, uh, maybe this is yet to be fulfilled and, and details, you know, we'll see how those things pan out. Now, my rule of interpreting biblical prophecy, if I haven't given it, I need to give it right here. Uh, future prophecy is always easier to understand after it has been fulfilled. And because there are so many possible interpretations, maybe the, this last one is also in view. That maybe the reason there's so many possible interpretations is maybe we're still waiting for a future fulfillment. And, and that's possible. Or it might be one or a number of these. So we have, you know, we started off with the dangerous deception, man of sin, and we're seeing those warnings that must precede the day of the Lord. 
And then Paul gives thanksgiving for his gracious choice. Uh, he says in verse 13, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. And he did it through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Notice that, that his choosing isn't like no, no matter what. It's, it's choosing uh, has to do with, with those who uh, were, were chosen by faith. And it was for this he called you, verse 14, through our gospel, so it, it includes the gospel, but God chose you from the beginning. And he chose you through the gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come to chapter 3, and this is a call to stay steadfast in Christ. And so, uh, notice chapters 1 and 2 uh, tell us what we're to believe regarding the future. And then chapter 3 tells us how we are to live in the present on the basis of what's going to happen in the future. And so he says, finally, brethren, chapter 3, verse 1, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified and that we'll be rescued from perverse and evil men. Because, you know, not everybody has the truth. So there's a call to prayer. Um, and he prays, but he says, both pray for us, and, and we're going to be praying for you. Uh, verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. And then there is a call to separation from unruliness. We command you, brethren, this is verse 6, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you've received from us. Because you ought to follow our example. How, you know, we didn't eat anybody's bread without paying for it. and uh, we, we lived a, a proper type of life. And you ought to do so too. And that involves uh, working with your hands. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then, then he shouldn't eat either. Uh, so, you know, yes, we're, we're giving. But that's not an excuse for people to just, you know, sit back and... and uh, and not work, and let others do their working for them. Verse 11, For we hear that there's some among you that are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. And that ought not to be. And so he gives a closing benediction, verses 16, uh, Now may the, the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstances. May the Lord be with you all. And he writes his greeting with his own hand, with a, apparently he had a special signature with a distinguishing mark in every letter. And this is the way I write. So if you don't see this, maybe maybe it's not for me. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.